Uh, we're pleased to have as our guest preacher today, Mark Smithers. Mark lives in Belfast with his wife, Eileen, their two kids, and their border colleague, Fly. He attends the Sojourners Mennonite Fellowship in uh, Belfast, serves on its leadership team as the coordinator of the service team. Mark holds a master's in higher education, a doctorate in organizational leadership, and currently works as a grants researcher after serving 14 years in student affairs. So Mark, we welcome you to our church this morning and look forward to your message later in the service. We have a few announcements today. If you wish to send a card to Mary Lou Cartridge, uh, her home address is printed in, in the uh, Sunday Bulletin. And we're happy to see Jerry was, is able to join us and be with us this morning, too. Uh, please help the Board of Elders plan our worship services during this time of transition by completing the brief uh, worship evaluation form uh, that uh, is, uh, and we ask that you complete one each week. Printed forms are available every Sunday as an insert in the bulletin. And after you've completed them, uh, please place them in the basket at the back of the sanctuary. Or you can complete one online anytime on our website. And the link is uh, listed in uh, the Sunday bulletin. Also a note that our guest preacher next week will be Jonathan Case. One further announcement, the uh, remnants of the church library have been moved to the roaming room in the church building. Feel free to take books and bring them back as you are able. Now, uh, please join me in the call to worship. Found in your door. We look at this world focusing on the pain and the confusion, the fears, the hatred which seem to abound. For what might be alone? We wait for the goodness of creation to be made manifest in all the world. For this is the promise of God. God is always with us, guiding, rescuing, healing, restoring. Get ready. The promises of God are true. Lord, apply our spirits and open our hearts. Bring us hope.
has created God. We're grateful for today and the opportunity to gather together in worship. We're grateful for the ways in which you reveal your faithfulness to us each day. For the ways in which your mercy is made new every morning. And we're grateful for this beautiful world that we're able to share together. Lord God, we, we come to you now knowing that we need you. That, that the, this creation that is uh, so wonderful and so beautiful uh, is groaning and uh, is in need of redemption and salvation as we are. Um, and we just ask for your mercy. We ask that you would meet us in this space this morning, that you would give us hearts sensitive to your spirit, your spirit's leading, and we ask that that you would work within us. We especially bring uh, to you the concerns uh, that were shared this morning, that, um, that you would be gracious um, and healing um, for those that need your touch. God, be with us in this time of silence as we bring you the needs and concerns of our hearts to you. And may you meet us here.
If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. At this time, as we offer ourselves in commitment, let's uh, keep in mind that we're called to share the good news, the good news of God's love. We're called to share our resources of time, energy, prayer, money, our very selves, in ways that enable us and others to continue the ministry that Jesus began. So let us present ourselves and our offerings today.
ministries of this church, for your work in our community and across the world. Through our giving, we want to share Jesus' message of love and hope and the promise of new life in Jesus. Amen. Excited to see that Romans 8 
uh, was, was the section of the lectionary for today. Um, before I get started, though, I just want to say how uh, uh, glad I am to be with you this morning. Uh, Alfred holds a very special place in my heart, uh, uh, not just because uh, I've gotten to know uh, John Laurel over the past several years, um, and also because he had the best farmer's market in the area, uh, which I come to very frequently, but uh, also because my wife is currently finishing up her uh, nursing degree at Alfred State. She decided to go back to school um, uh, a couple of years ago, so uh, we've had the pleasure of coming here uh, quite frequently over the last couple of years, and so it's, it's really a joy to be with you, uh, and especially to be speaking with you, uh, sort of sandwiched between so many people that I love and respect. Uh, uh, John Case was one of my professors in college, so uh, the fact that I am sort of warming you up for him is really humbling for me. <laughs> um, but as I was saying, today, today's scripture reading from, from the lectionary in Romans 8 is, is something that is a passage that holds a particular place um, in my journey of faith. I grew up in a Christian household, and my family was very involved in our church. Uh, and I remember talking with my dad once about how I didn't really enjoy reading the Bible very much. I had just gotten a, a Bible from the church for memorizing all the books of the Bible. Uh, it was the, the Adventure Bible, and it was blue. Uh, and I remember that it was um, peppered with all these different uh, uh, exciting um, drawings and, and uh, elaborations on the stories in the Bible to try to captivate a nine-year-old's attention. It just wasn't working for me. Uh, and so uh, when my dad asked if I was going to take my new Bible to church with me the next Sunday, I said I didn't really want to because I don't really enjoy reading the Bible that much. Uh, and my dad, uh, I remember very clearly saying how much he enjoyed the book of Romans. And so he said, well, you should start with the book of Romans, especially chapter 8. I love chapter 8. Uh, he came to faith later in life, and so I think that um, uh, the book of Romans was just a, a very particularly uh, apt book for him to be reading in that time of his life, and so he's always loved this book, and especially this chapter. Uh, that wasn't a particularly transformative conversation for me, and I, I uh, still struggle with parts of Romans uh, to this day, but um, it was something that was very special for me. As I saw what the, the reading was for today, I, I immediately thought of him. And chapter 8 especially serves as a sort of turning point in the book of Romans. Chapters 1 through 3 deals with sin and its effect on humanity. And then Paul talks about the concepts of justification and sanctification and the ways in which the law was insufficient in restoring our relationship to God. And after spending these first seven chapters describing the ways in which we need salvation, Paul describes the role of the Holy Spirit in giving us new life. One which is not under the life, life under the law, as described in the first chapters of Romans. And looking specifically at the reading for today, it's interesting to note that this is not the first time that Paul mentions creation in Romans. He's referring to it actually first in Romans 1, and he reintroduces it here. Back in Romans 1, he points out the foolishness of those who because they could not see God's divinity and goodness in creation, decided to make idols. Paul says that they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being or birds or four-footed animals or reptiles in verse 23 of that first chapter. Do you see the parallel he's drawing here? Paul is pointing back to those who he had talked about in chapter 1 who had, for whatever reason, chosen to make a part of creation, the material world, something more, something godlike. They personified aspects of creation, worshiping them as if they are something more than they, what they are, created beings, created things. And Paul reintroduces this concept of creation from chapter 1, and it's almost like he takes it a step farther. It's like he's saying, Right? So you want to personify parts of creation and worship them and put them above your creator. I'll go one step farther. He says that creation as a whole, all the birds, the fish, the trees, the sun, the moon, the stars, all of it, it's groaning. Now, 
course, it's not actually groaning. I've never heard a fish groan or anything like that, audibly at least. Um, but Paul is affording these human characteristics, this personification that he reprimanded them for back in chapter 1. He's personifying creation, saying that it's groaning, it's waiting, it's aching for the full and total redemption of all creation. It's groaning for all to be made right. And unlike those who wanted to make idols of some part of creation and believe that it's going to save them, to put their hope in a material thing above God, he's saying that this personification, this groaning, is actually because creation recognizes that things are not right and creation itself can't make it right. That only the redemption brought through Christ is what makes all things new. I love this rhetorical device that Paul uses, in part because he uses it as a way to create a reason for believers to end in hope, not in self-pity or despair. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But more so, I love the way that Paul draws parallels to Romans 1 because I'm fascinated at how this speaks to the totality of how sin and death have affected all of creation. Let me explain. In the tradition that I was raised in, a lot of the focus around conversations um, uh, around salvation pretty much stopped with the individual believer. A lot of focus was actually put on Romans 3. All have fallen into sin, and uh, uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin was something that separated the individual Christian from God, and it was largely spoken of as individual actions or even as a wholesale depravity that ultimately needed to be paid through the death and res res resurrection of Jesus. And once the individual Christian reconciled with God, they were individually made right with God. The first passage, the first part of the passage today actually speaks to that a bit. Uh, verse 13, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. Now, while all of that, all of those things are elemental parts of our faith, what was almost never talked about when I was growing up, and even today, most of the churches that I, um, most of the church services that I've attended, almost never talk about the idea that sin has touched all parts of creation. That creation itself is subject to death and decay. The Calvinist doctrine of total depravity, for instance, focuses more on the breadth of an individual's sin than on the depth or on the width of, uh, of that sin. The Westminster Confession uh, speaks of sin as something we've inherited that's left us wholly defiled in all parts of, and faculties of soul and body. Instead, one of the aspects that I hear Paul pointing to us, us to in these verses, and in its reminiscence of Romans 1, is not so much the depth of individual sin, but rather the breadth of sin's effects on the whole of creation. That sin and death are not simply something to mourn for its effects on the individual believer, but should be something that we both recognize and mourn for its effects on all of creation. And while we may at times mourn how creation is itself suffering, how much more do we move through our daily lives giving little notice to the way that creation is groaning. Groaning because it's been subjected to futility. The Greek word here is mata, mateotes, and it means ineffectiveness or emptiness or purposelessness. Paul is saying that creation is groaning, in essence, because it's lost its meaning, its purpose. And we can sense this, right? We can sense that things are not right. That death and decay has struck all parts of creation and not just humanity. We see it in the oceans warming and piling up with trash and in the destruction of habitats. And even more, we can see it just in the chaotic unpredictability of nature itself. Now, I don't mean to imply that Paul is speaking some sort of inconvenient truth here uh, and that there's some sort of covert, eco friendly message. Although I wish that was the case, because it would make things a lot easier when I'm trying to talk to other Christians about sustainability. I wish you could just come out and say that that's what we should do. But I don't think that's what he's saying right here. Rather, I feel like Paul is, in essence, situating us in creation. 
reminding of us, reminding us of our created nature. And that just as creation is groaning, just as creation as it is in anguish because of things not being quite right, needing freedom from its death and destruction, we too, as created beings, are as much in need of this relief as well. John Gilman, a theologian, points out the parallels that Paul draws uh, between creation and the children of God in verses 18 to 25. Verse 19, creation waits with eager longing. Verse 23, we wait for adoption. Verse 22, creation groans in labor pains. Verse 23, we too groan inwardly. Verse 20, and then into 21, creation hopes that it will be set free. Verse 24, in hope we were saved. I think Paul is situating us in creation. Creation waits, we wait. Creation groans, we groan. Creation hopes, we hope. In many ways, we're not that different from creation, which is kind of a funny thing to say after just a few verses earlier, Paul had gone to great lengths to emphasize that we should not be living according to the flesh. But this is actually a helpful distinction to draw out. Living according to the flesh is not the same thing as recognizing one's status as a part of creation. Living according to the flesh prioritizes the stuff of this world. Living with an understanding that one is a part of creation prioritizes the will of the Creator. Living according to the flesh hopes that the material things of this world, your money, your intellect, your political party, these are the things that are going to save you. These are the things that you should ultimately hope for. Living with an understanding that one is part of creation causes one to put your ultimate hope in the love and care of a compassionate creator. Paul is trying to remind the Romans and remind us that we cannot save ourselves. And we cannot and should not hope in ourselves. Just as creation has been subjected to futility, we too groan inwardly as we, what, save ourselves? No, as we wait for adoption as we wait for the redemption of our bodies. In our groaning, we wait and hope that all things will be well. We cannot save ourselves, but how often do we pretend that we can? How often do we convince ourselves that we have the tools within us to make things better? Or maybe we're humble enough to not put so much faith in ourselves as individuals, but maybe we believe deep down that humanity has what it needs uh, and doesn't need to give much thought to the groanings of creation or the love of our Creator. Perhaps we believe that the death and destruction we see creation subjected to will ultimately be fixed by the right technology that hasn't been perfected yet, or solved by the smartest minds that haven't gotten published yet, or financed by the right governmental policy that will decrease greenhouse gases to a sustainable level. Frankly, if we listen closely to most of the groanings of humanity, and even more so, unfortunately, the groaning of believers, you would think that God and His kingdom have very little to do with the solutions that we put our faith in. Most of the groaning I hear from Christians deals with grasping for political power or for more legal protections for religious rights. But what does this have to do with adoption? What does political power have to do with redemption? If these desires were to be granted, for instance, in America, become some form of theocratic people state, God forbid, with religious rights completely and ultimately protected and all unlimited political power afforded to the godly few in American government, would creation not still be groaning? Would we be any closer to redemption and fulfillment of God's kingdom? I need to confess to you that as I was preparing to speak on today's lectionary reading, I I grew increasingly uncomfortable with how poor of a messenger I feel that I am in talking with you about the groanings of creation and believers. Because for as messed up as much of the groaning being done by American Christians today is, I know better. I am far too often a contributor to these kinds of groanings. Frankly, lately I feel crushed by the weight of the sufferings of the world. The war in Ukraine, the corruption and greed of American politics, the economy that allows for astronomical wealth to build untouched, the broken immigration system in a world that increasingly distrusts anyone from the other side of whatever issue you are on. I know better. The groaning I do is often hopeless. 
The groaning I do is frequently one-sided, and I confess that I put far too much faith in myself and other people to fix all the ills of the world. I'm often not sensitive also to the groanings of creation, especially those that don't daily affect me, that I can distance myself from. And I'm often a poor listener to the groanings of other believers who have been historically marginalized and ignored and silenced. So I would encourage you to ask yourself with me, am I fully listening to the groaning of creation? Am I only hearing the groaning of those I agree with, those I want to listen to? Or am I being sensitive to and acknowledging the groaning of those who have been forgotten, those who have been abused, and those who have been unwelcomed? Lord, have mercy on us and give us ears to hear your creation and your people whom we have for so long closed our ears to. One final point I want to draw your attention to. It's curious that Paul describes us in verse 23 as groaning while we wait for adoption. Whereas just a few verses earlier, in verse 15, he assures us that we have received the spirit of adoption. How can we be waiting for adoption while also having received the spirit of adoption? Which is it? This is where I love the way in which Paul uses the metaphor of labor and child rearing as a dominant metaphor in these verses. He describes creation as groaning, specifically the kind of groaning during labor. And we have been called into faith, not as impersonal members of some religious institution that Jesus started, but no, we're called children of God, adopted, and are now heirs with Christ. But this adoption has that quality of already and not quiteness that we see in Jesus' description of God's kingdom. Just as God's kingdom was proclaimed as having come with Jesus' incarnation, but its full consummation has not yet happened. Similarly, our adoption is a present reality and our full redemption is not yet complete. Labor is a perfect metaphor here to describe the already and not quiteness of God's kingdom and our adoption into it. From my own experience, when I found out that my wife and I were going to have our daughter, I immediately felt like a father when I watched this tiny seed-like thing stare back at me from an ultrasound machine. But, I also felt like I was not yet completely a father as soon as I left that room because I couldn't see anything at that point. I really only felt like a father when I could see her. And when she was born, I remember feeling in awe at how she was fully and completely herself. That she had her complete essence of who she was and is. But, to this very day, she is still growing into the person that God has made her to be. So she's fully her when she was born, but she's also fully becoming herself every day. This tension of the already and the not yet deserves a much longer reflection, but it's a good concept to end this passage on as it points us to the hope with which Paul points us to in the midst of our groaning. And labor pains are a form of suffering, yes, but they're also a sign of hope, a sign of new birth that's to come. They represent a pain that is leading to something more, something wonderful. And therefore, we can rejoice in that hope and faith that we have that God is who He has revealed Himself to be, and He has given us new life. We can rejoice in the knowledge that Christ ushered into the world the present reality of His kingdom on earth, that we've been adopted into the family of God and are co-heirs with Christ. And at the same time, we can groan for the coming fulfillment of this reality of God's kingdom. As we are still in the not yet part of that story. We groan with creation for the final end to death and destruction, for an end to injustice and injury, and we groan for the redemption of all things made new by our Creator. And as Paul goes on to say directly after this passage, the Holy Spirit groans for us when we don't know how to pray as we ought, interceding with sighs too deep for words. May our hearts then be open to hearing the groaning of creation, the groaning of other believers, 
and the groaning of the Holy Spirit who helps us in our weakness. And may our groaning be helpful, founded in our hope in the God who has defeated death and welcomes us as his children. Amen.
surpasses all understanding. Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, who helps us in our weakness, interceding on our behalf with sighs to deep for words, bind us together as we leave this place. And may you go forth in confidence and joy, knowing that wherever you go, you are surrounded by the love and mercy 